Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the 24th Parkinson's Academy webinar. My name is Diga Hastis, and I'm the head of the Parkinson's Academy and the chair for both sessions this afternoon. Before we start, I would like to express a huge thank you to Zambon Limited for sponsoring the learning this afternoon. We will be kicking off with Suzanne Timmons and Irisima Leroy discussing neuropsychiatric signs and symptoms in Parkinson's disease. Hi there, everyone. I'll just share my screen with you. Perfect. So I'm going to talk to you about cognitive and neuropsychiatric symptoms in Parkinson's disease. And I run a movement disorder clinic in Cork and I'm a professor of geriatric medicine in University College Cork. So Parkinson's disease affects cognition. In fact, a lot of people will already have cognitive impairment when they first come to clinic. And by about eight years, 70 to 80% will have developed it. And we call this Parkinson's disease MCI. And then over time, a portion of people will progress to dementia. And that depends on your age and your disease severity, but somewhere between 20 and 50%. And I'll talk to you a little bit more about how you know what range of that a person might lie within. So after about 10 years, 20 to 50% of people will have developed dementia. And we call this Parkinson's disease dementia. Now, Parkinson's disease dementia is what we call a Lewy body dementia. In other words, the protein that's building up abnormally in the brain is alpha synuclein and it's called Lewy bodies. And you might be familiar with another Lewy body dementia called dementia with Lewy bodies. And basically, these are very similar. They both have the same protein building up throughout the brain. And there's an artificial separation between them based on the timing. Um, so basically, if you have Parkinsonism and dementia within quick succession, within a year of each other, we call that dementia with Lewy bodies. And if you have Parkinson's disease for many years and then you develop dementia, we call it Parkinson's disease dementia. And there are people who lie at either end of that spectrum, but unfortunately, there's also people where maybe there's a little bit of a grey area and we wonder, is that a true differentiation between two diseases or are these not just two sides of a spectrum? So why do people with Parkinson's disease um, develop dementia? So, oh, sorry, I, just, I was hoping to get rid of something they're showing on my screen. Um, so basically, um, we know that in Parkinson's disease, people have alpha synuclein building up abnormally in their brain. And it starts off in the actual brainstem. At that time, a person won't have any motor features. They will have mood problems. They'll have sleep problems. They'll have constipation because these are all controlled by the brainstem. And indeed, we think the pathology has probably in some cases spread up through their vagus nerve from their gut and in other cases spread in through their olfactory nerve. And it's only when the disease gets to the midbrain that a person will start to have motor features that, you know, you know, tremor, bradykinesia, rigidity. And then unfortunately, over time, the disease will continue spreading to the whole cortex. And when it gets to our limbic areas or temporal cortex, the person will start to have dementia. So that's a very simplified view that basically, you know, the development, the transition from Parkinson's disease to Parkinson's disease with dementia depends on a critical mass of alpha synuclein and its location in the brain. And to some degree, this is true. You know, Parkinson's disease dementia develops when there's a critical burden of um, Lewy bodies in your cortex. And this is a picture of a typical Lewy body collection of alpha synuclein. But interestingly, we know an awful lot of people with Parkinson's disease dementia have quite a burden of Alzheimer's pathology. So you'd be familiar with this, your plaques and your tangles, and also vascular pathology. So it's not quite as straightforward as it's all related to alpha synuclein. So we actually know what people are at risks of um, Parkinson's disease dementia. And the biggest risk factor is advancing age. So um, the older you are, the more likely you are to have dementia. So a, a person with Parkinson's disease in their 50s may well 10 or 15 years into the disease have no dementia. A person who develops Parkinson's at 80 within five years may develop dementia. And you'll understand this because the brain, the person has you know, poor brain reserve, they're more likely to have vascular pathology, and they're more likely to have coincidental Alzheimer's pathology. To some degree, the risk for dementia also depends on your motor findings and your severity of your disease, particularly if you have prominent rigidity rather than tremor, if you've prominent falls and postural instability. 
And then there's some other features a person might have that give us clues they're at higher risk. Things like daytime sleepiness, having an REM sleep disturbance, having depression and apathy, having hallucinations, having already some signs of cognitive impairment like low verbal fluency or executive dysfunctioning. And if someone has had genetic testing and they have APOE gene, then they're at higher risk. And so there's been a lovely systematic review published this year and meta-analysis, which I think very eloquently shows us um, how a person's risk increases with certain factors. So you see, these are all basically, this is kind of the average finding, and this is the range of multiple studies that have been published in each of these areas. And you'll see generally as a person gets older, the risk is higher, not so much influenced by education. Depending on the duration of their Parkinson's, their risk increases, and depending on their hone and yard stage. And this is basically a global uh, scoring for Parkinson's, where you go from one, which is unilateral disease, right up to five, which is palliative stage Parkinson's. So if we have somebody who's in their 80s with Parkinson's for 10 or 15 years and hone and yard stage three, they might be up at a 60% rate of dementia, whereas a younger person with early onset might be down at a kind of a 10%, 15% prevalence. So obviously we should be measuring cognition in anyone with Parkinson's disease. And certainly at my clinic, I would routinely um, screen with a, a cognitive test every year to two years, depending on the person. So once they start to drop, I start to screen more often. But we have to be very careful when we're measuring cognition in a person with Parkinson's. So a kind of a core part of Parkinson's is having slow thought processes and slow responses. And we call that bradyphrenia. And it's very much related to your off periods. So a person might fluctuate within a day and between days. So if you were assessing someone for cognition and they were quite off at the time, their cognitive score could be significantly lower than on another day where they weren't fatigued and they were on and they were in a kind of a perfect state. And so you might think that their cognition had responded to medication or not, but actually it's day to day fluctuation. So the bottom line is we should always make sure a person's in their optimum state as on as they can be when we do cognitive testing. We have to be really careful in interpreting tests that relied on motor function. So where a person's dominant hand is affected, you know, copying cubes and things like that is all going to be affected. Equally, if we're doing cognitive testing that relies on speech, again, if a person has a stammer, has pallidolia, they're going to really struggle to answer our questions. So we have to differentiate motor effects from cognitive effects. And I suppose critically, Parkinson's disease is what we call a subcortical dementia. So it's mainly affecting the inside nuclei of the brain rather than the cortex. So if you like to think of it as spreading from the inside out. And so that means that certain tests like an MMSC may not particularly um, identify the cognitive problems a person has. So what are those particular cognitive problems? So in terms of memory, unlike somebody with Alzheimer's disease, a person with Parkinson's disease can actually lay down memories really well and store them really well. Their problem is with retrieval. So they haven't forgotten something, but they may not be able to think of it in the moment, but they'll respond well to being seen, shown options, multiple choice and cues. So it's a retrieval problem. Similarly, they have problems with executive functioning in shifting attention between tasks, uh, in you know, um, anything really that kind of relates to sequencing and attention. And they'll have reduced verbal fluency. And we test this with things like, you know, um, how many words can you say that begin with a certain letter within a minute and all. And I hope this is, I think I'm just actually going to close this down because I think I may be blocking part of my slides for you. Um, you will all be familiar with the clock drawing test. A person with Parkinson's disease would have problems with this. This is a Stroop word test. So in the first column, you'll see the word red is in red font. So that's congruous. In the next column, it's incongruous. The word red is written in yellow font. So you may give a person instruction to read the word as it's written or to say the color they see. And obviously there's a challenge there for the brain for paying attention to one thing and not the other. I've also shown you some trail making tests. You might be familiar with these where a person might have to go up in sequence in numbers or in letters 
or here the trail making test B where they go up alternately in numbers or letters. And that's obviously quite a challenge for a person with Parkinson's to be able to alternately flip between numbers and letters. Person with Parkinson's will all usually have visuospatial problems, so clock drawing and cube copying and all is affected, but their orientation is really well preserved. So they know the day, they know the year, they know where they are. And they typically don't have core language problems like aphasia or agnosias. And so when we put all of this together, you'll see how a test like the MMSC doesn't really capture their problems and they may actually score really well on this. So our test of choice is the Montreal Cognitive Assessment or some other detailed neuropsychological test that's going to particularly focus on attention, executive functioning and visual spatial. And um, so I'd say you're all probably quite familiar with the Montreal Cognitive Assessment and obviously this particular training you can do in it. Um, so in my clinic, we once got people to do an MMSE and to do a Montreal Cognitive Assessment and it was staggering the difference between them. Quite a number of people scored 28 or 29 out of 13 in MMSE and maybe 13 or 15 in a mock -up. So it really unmasked their cognitive problems. So I'm not going to go through the treatment of dementia and cognitive problems in Parkinson's. Professor Leroy will come to this when I'm finished. But I did want to move on to non-cognitive symptoms. So um, we have a condition that we call Parkinson's disease psychosis. Um, and this is basically hallucinations or um, hallucinations or delusions. So first of all, talking about hallucinations, 30% of people with Parkinson's suffer hallucinations, and it's obviously much higher if you already have Parkinson's disease dementia. And it's really strongly linked with sleep disturbances. Most of the hallucinations are visual, and they can range from kind of, you know, out of the peripheries, just kind of shapes and lights and things like that, to well-formed complex. And in fact, this is more common that people will say they actually see an animal, they see a child, they see a dead family member in the room with them. Sometimes they'll have what we call presence hallucinations where you just feel there's someone there or a passage hallucination where you feel as if someone has just passed by out of sight. And if you turn quickly, you catch them. And I suppose it's really important that we don't confuse illusions for hallucinations because a person with Parkinson's may well have problems with processing visual information. So they may mistake something like thinking a coat as a person. So again, be a little bit cautious about hallucinations that are only happening in dim lighting and in the evenings. And similarly, I'm always really skeptical of hallucinations that occur only in the middle of the night, because people with Parkinson's suffer from a thing called vivid dreams, where they have a dream that is so realistic. And when they wake up, they remember it with such clarity that it's as if it actually happened. And they may describe it to people as it happened. So in the middle of the night, someone came into the room and they talked to me and I did this and I did the other. And people may think they hallucinated it, but actually they dreamt it. So again, if the person's only hallucinating in the middle of the night, think to yourself, is it really a hallucination or is it a vivid dream? And of course, hallucinations don't have to be visual, so they can be tactile, particularly things crawling in your skin. They might be olfactory because the olfactory nerve is particularly affected in Parkinson's. It can be auditory or gustatory. And they do link with dementia. So as I said, you know, anyone with Parkinson's can have hallucinations, but they become more common when you develop dementia. And at the start, often people have insight, so they know their dead family members, not, they really know they're not in the room, and yet they see them very clearly. And a lot of times it's just a, a little major quirk that someone tells you about, but they're not distressing generally. But sometimes they can be distressing, so people can start to see, you know, people fighting each other and skeletons and things like that. And that's when we move on to needing to treat. And again, Professor Leroy will go through the treatments. So delusions link very much with hallucinations. They often co-occur, but they are separate. And in fact, delusions tend to happen a lot in younger Parkinson's patients and in men, and they can relate to medication side effects. And they typically tend to be negative. So rare, people rarely have kind of delusions of grandeur. They usually tend to be things like phantom border, where you think there's a stranger moved into your house and they're moving around and stealing your things or morbid jealousy where you think your partner is being unfaithful to you 
or a mis kind of perceiving who people are. And the very extreme form of this, you might be familiar with Capgris syndrome, where people think their partner or another family member has been replaced by an imposter who looks and sounds just like them, but they know it's not actually them. Or they might just have delusions of abandonment that the carer is planning at any moment to leave them. Um, and we know that a lot of delusions are a side effect of medications, particularly dopamine agonists, because these work on the limbic system. But you don't have to be on dopamine agonists. So it is probably related to actual core serotonergic function as well. And again, Professor Leroy will go through some of the approaches we use to try to minimize both delusions and hallucinations. And then the last group of neuropsychiatric symptoms I wanted to talk about are often grouped together as what's called disinhibitory psychomotor behaviours, or these are often also termed impulse control disorders. And basically, it's where someone does something that's in some way pleasurable to the brain again and again and again. So they're driven to do it. And that can be everything from gambling to hypersexuality to eating, etc. So it's a person is overly driven by the reward system. In its kind of more, if I could say, benign state, you have a thing called punding or excessive hobbyism. And that's where a person will just spend hours on their hobby, whether it's playing an instrument or, you know, playing with the train set or collecting things or hoarding things. So um, it's often not particularly bothering other people or it's not going to get them into trouble with the law, but it could be quite annoying to live with the person. Whereas obviously the impulse control disorders where someone is gambling or being totally reckless can actually bring a person with Parkinson's in front of a court. And then I suppose linked to that we have where the person's impulsivity and their addiction is actually to their own medications. So sometimes we'll see people at clinic who clearly are dyskinetic and yet they're saying, no, no, I feel I'm off. I feel I need to take more medications. So it's like as if they get addicted to their own medications. So about 14 to 40 percent of people with Parkinson's will have some form of impulse control disorder if we ask about it, because a lot of people will not volunteer that they or their spouse, you know, has a changed personality and things like, you know, hypersexuality, gambling are not things that people might report to their doctor. So we need to ask about them again more common in men and in younger patients and often closely linked with delusions so for example someone might have hypersexuality and associated with that they may have um, morbid jealousy and then I just wanted to I suppose mention the other common non-cognitive symptoms that anyone with dementia can have that I don't think are particularly that different in, in Parkinson's disease. So obviously depression and anxiety are really common and we know these are often pre-morbid. So the, before the person actually even realizes they have Parkinson's, they may have depression. In fact, depression increases your risk of Parkinson's about twofold. Um, and associated with that, or separate to that, people can have apathy. So again, that's reflecting frontal lobe pathology often. And again, we'd see this particularly with things like progressive supranuclear palsy or other atypical Parkinson's, or impulsivity, where a person is reckless and will keep making bad decisions again and again. And of course, people with Parkinson's can have agitation and restlessness and aggression, um, even though, to be honest, anger and aggression often are not common unless it's driven by hallucinations or delusions. And they can have repetitive behaviours, again, often linked with impulse control disorders. So to finish with, and I hope again the top of this is visible to you, as I look at disease progression over time, I find it helpful to think of neuropsychiatric symptoms under five big categories. So early on, and indeed before they even are diagnosed, a person may have a mood disorder. As time goes on, a person may develop delusions and or impulse control disorders, and these often are linked to medications, but not exclusively. And then as a marker of more advanced disease, we start to get more and more cognitive impairment and often linked to hallucinations, but these can occur without any cognitive impairment. So for me, I find it helpful to think of neuropsychiatric syndrome symptoms under those five headings. So that's the end of my talk, and I'll be handing you over now to Professor Leroy, who will go back over these and talk a little bit more about how we actually manage them for a patient. So I'll stop sharing there and hand you back now to our chair. Thank you very much, Susan. Um, and um, delegates, please start thinking about questions for Suzanne, which um, we will be taking after Ibizima has done her talk. So over to you. 
Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Daya, and thank you, Suzanne, for that extremely lovely overview. Um, so I will be addressing some of the treatment elements, but of course, it's a huge topic. So in the short time we have, I've decided to focus mostly on the cognitive elements. But again, we can always address other issues in question or in a different session at a different time. So let me get my slides up here. There we go. All right. Thanks very much. Now, um, I've entitled this a management of Lewy body dementias. Now, the focus here, of course, is on the neuropsychiatric aspects of Parkinson's disease. But as many of you will know, the Lewy body dementias are very much an umbrella term and incorporate PDD, Parkinson's disease, dementia, and dementia with Lewy bodies. And in many kind of cases, it's very hard to tease them apart. So quite often, we think of the intervention and the treatment together. And of course, this also encompasses PDMCI, mild cognitive impairment, and also prodromal DLB. In other words, people presenting with a Lewy body type presentation, which can look very much like Parkinson's disease with psychosis or PD and other neuropsychiatric symptoms, but it isn't in the full dementia stage. In other words, prodromal DLB. That's been an extremely exciting time for the neuropsychiatry of PD over the last number of years, starting off the 1980s, where depression in Parkinson's disease really became an important landmark or important model for how we understood primary depression in people without PD. And that then led to the 1990s, where we had the use of clozapine being licensed specifically for PD psychosis. And that was a real departure. And of course, as many of you will be aware, clozapine in Parkinson's is used very differently than it is in schizophrenia. In other words, we use minuscule doses compared to um, the indications in schizophrenia. The 2000s came along with rivastigmine being specifically licensed for PDD, and I'll say quite a bit about that in my talk as we go through. And that was absolutely essential and a landmark in terms of really changing the conversation, starting to focus much more on the cognitive aspects and the risk of developing dementia in PD, which hitherto really hadn't had much attention. And finally, more recently, the licensing of pimavanserin, an atypical antipsychotic with serotonergic properties. Now, this is only licensed in the States, but the trials were done across Europe as well, and the results were very promising, again, specifically for PD psychosis. So it's been an interesting time. Um, and of course, this is a highly complex condition. And the way to address this isn't just with pharmacological approaches, of course, but we also need non-pharmacological approaches. So really, we need the wraparound MDT involved in trying to manage these complex conditions. And I hope to address both of these aspects in my talk, specifically focusing on cognition. Now, if you can see here, I said focus on deficits or improving outcomes. What we are not at this stage able to do is to think about disease modification. Now, that in the neurodegenerative diseases anyway is the holy grail. And if we figure this out in other conditions like Alzheimer's disease, we'll be able to figure it out in Parkinson's and DLB. Okay, so let's just touch on some of the drug interventions. So first of all, the key, the key message, which many of you will be familiar with already, is that we have a licensed treatment for Parkinson's disease or PDD only. So that's rivastigmine. We do not have licensed drug treatments for PDMCI, so mild cognitive impairment in PD, nor prodromal DLB, nor dementia with Lewy body. And as just mentioned, there are no disease modifying treatments. But again, of course, the key thing is that at some point, if we can intervene very early, like in PDMCI or prodromal DLB, we can hopefully obviate the progression to the full dementia syndrome. So the current treatments really focus on symptom management and of course, improving quality of life, as well as other aspects such as reducing carer burden and ultimately ensuring that we reduce the risk of institutionalization. Because as many of you will know, the key risk factor for institutionalization in people with Parkinson's disease is in fact visual hallucinations. So rather than people becoming motorically or physically impaired, requiring admission, it, or rather requiring institutionalization for long-term care, it is actually the neuropsychiatric symptoms that put one at higher risk. Everything we do in terms of the neuropsychiatric management in Parkinson's is compromise and negotiation. In other words, addressing this idea of the motion-emotion conundrum. So when we try to improve motion and improve people's motor function by increasing their dopaminergic load, it very often comes at the compromise 
of or the comes at the expense rather of their emotional well-being. In other words, increasing dopaminergic load, particularly in more fragile, advanced or older patients, we result in increasing the risk of confusion, hallucinations and so on. So it's always trying to strike a balance because, of course, we can't remove the dopamine replacement entirely. But again, we need to sort of try to optimize uh, doses as best as possible. So I just want to sort of touch on this idea of the dual syndrome hypothesis about um, dementia developing in Parkinson's disease and why it's important, because if you follow this hypothesis, which is quite a lot of evidence to support it over a number of years, what we see is that the underlying neuro, uh, the underlying pharmacological deficit, neurotransmitter deficits are quite different in the group of people we call dementia sparing versus dementia prone. And therefore, potentially, our drug treatments might have to differ depending on which group a person finds themselves in. Now, ultimately, this is a model, it's a heuristic, but I think it can inform treatment in an important way. So, for example, in people who are dementia sparing, in other words, lower risk of developing dementia, very often they might be younger in age, younger in onset of PD, but they tend to have much more difficulties in attention, working memory, and executive function. In other words, frontostriatal networks being affected, and these are modulated largely by dopamine and noradrenaline loss. In other words, thinking about drug treatment, the focus there is very different from, say, people with a profile two who tend to be older, tend to have Parkinson's for much longer, sort of an average of eight years plus, often present with non-tremor dominant Parkinson's. And here we have a much more sort of posterior cortical type degeneration modulated by acetylcholine. And these people present much more in a typical kind of cortical or dementia type presentation with memory impairment, language, visual, spatial impairment, and tend to be what we call dementia prone. So again, thinking about the differences in neurotransmitters, that informs the differences in interventions. Let's focus, first of all, on the more typical PDD, people who present with dementia profile that looks very much more typical, looking to slightly more like the Alzheimer picture with memory, language, and visual spatial function impaired. The initial story here is about really trying to address this cholinergic deficit that seems to be driving this PDD type presentation. And one of the first publications came out of my group, which was looking at denepazole. And the important thing about this, of course, that it added to the body of evidence that eventually led to the licensing of rivastigmine. And the key findings are, first of all, that these medications are well tolerated in this population, even though initially, of course, were licensed for Alzheimer's disease. And where are we now? There are a number of trials, but the key one is the express trial that was already a number of years old, leading to rivastigmine being licensed, either the oral or the patch, and I'll say a little bit more about that as we go. So I'd like to spend a few minutes on the express trial simply because there are a lot of important learning that came out of it. The first point is that it was a large sample size for a Parkinson's disease dementia group, which was fantastic. That was a real achievement in terms of clinical trials in a complex group of people, over 500 people. And the key finding was that there was a significant a level of a significant, statistically significant improvement on the overall composite score called the ADAS-COG. Now, keeping in mind that's an Alzheimer's disease outcome measure, it's not specific to Parkinson's, 2.1 points isn't particularly significant, and it isn't particularly large in terms of its clinical minimal point. However, it still persisted and showed that it was more helpful. And in fact, the key message really is that on all the secondary efficacy variables, there seemed to be significant favoring of rivastigmine as opposed to placebo, even more so than we see in Alzheimer's disease. In other words, this drug actually works better in the PDD setting than it does in the Alzheimer's disease setting. And what we've seen subsequently is that there are certain predictors of good response. So neuropsychiatrically, the more complex the patient, like, for example, if they present with visual hallucinations, the greater their response will be to these cholinergic drugs, to these um, cholinesterase inhibitors, of which rivastigmine is the core one. Now, a question that very often comes up patches or capsules. And very much this depends on the clinician and what they are comfortable with. I, for example, tend to use patches because I find that the side effect tolerability is much, much better in terms of GI side effects. And I'm then able to get to maximum dose in a greater proportion of people. This is particularly important in the DLB population, whereby we tend to push cholinesterase inhibitors beyond our sort of typical maximums that we would use in Alzheimer's disease. 
So for example, with the patches, we would go up to the third largest size, small, medium, and large. So we'd push the patch up to 13.3 milligrams for 24 hours. It's more difficult to do that in capsules because it's much less tolerated in terms of GI side effects. Having said that, as you can see here from this long-term 76-week study from Emory, that in fact, capsules seem to have a slightly better cognitive function in terms of outcomes versus patches. But I think this has to be balanced versus the tolerability because you really want to have the opportunity to go as high as you can based on tolerability. What are the key things to think about before starting cholinesterase inhibitor therapy? Absolutely similar things to you would do in a non-PDD or non-DLB population. But I think the key thing that you need to do first is try to optimize your therapy to the point where you're really getting rid of potential precipitants of abnormal mental states or deliriogenic or psychogenic or hallucinogenic medications. In other words, really bringing back your dopamine replacement therapy with last in first out rule, which comes from geriatrics, of course, and thinking about absolutely trying to get rid of anticholinergics and a large proportion of people with PD are still on cholinergics for many years then selegiline, amantadine, dopamine agonists, and so on. So there's no absolute rule for this. I think the key thing is last in, first out. And again, thinking about which drugs people respond best to in the more advanced stages, like, for example, levodopa, which you'll likely be left with, and getting rid of the really the key drugs that precipitate um, confusional state or impact on cognition, like dopamine agonists. So leaving the cholinesterase inhibitors aside, Let's now focus on memantine for a couple of minutes. So memantine, as many people will be familiar with, is licensed in Alzheimer's disease for a moderate stage and beyond, as well as for behavioral disturbance. Now, initially, you may not know that memantine was first licensed Parkinson's disease as an adjunct in Germany many years ago, but was felt not to be helping motor symptoms. So it really fell out of favor within the Parkinson's world. And it was only till we started looking at this from 2009 to bring this back into the Parkinson's world for cognition. And our initial study showed that certainly it's well tolerated, it can be used in combination with cholinesterase inhibitors safely, and also that after six weeks following drug withdrawal, we seem to see a greater drop in cognition in people who had been on the drug versus placebo. In other words, it seems that memantine may be needed to maintain a global level of functioning over time. Now, this was a small study, but I think one of the key things that really came out of this that was quite elegant was that we did a secondary analysis looking not at cognitive outcomes, but rather at goal attainment scaling. Now, goal attainment scaling is an approach in which you can really individualize the therapy or individualize the outcomes. No two people have the same outcomes. They set their goals as to what it is that they want to achieve. And there's a way of standardizing this across your entire cohort such that it can be used in clinical trials as an outcome measure. And what we found in this analysis is that people on memantine had significantly more goals attained compared to those not on memantine. So what we were trying to do here was really tap into much more meaningful, relevant, operationalable in the daily life type of outcomes rather than something more uh, static and quantifiable than cognitive outcomes. And this was really important because this types, tries to tap into those, those um, slightly abstract ideas that we try to get from patients when they come to clinics and report on their outcomes. You know, they seem to be better, they seem to be performing a little bit better, but you can't quite pinpoint how. I'll just move on from this other than to make the point in this slide is that not only with goal attainment being significantly better in the memantine group, but also caregiver burden was significantly better in the memantine treated group. Again, another factor that's important because in conditions like this, it's never just the individual. We're always working with a dyad, the person and their care partner. If the care breaks down, then of course, that's when institutionalization or long-term care looms. This was followed by a much larger trial, um, still not large enough to give us a clear indication as a definitive trial to lead to licensing of the drug, but this was led by Doug Arsland. And again, across a number of different outcomes, we saw some improvement, but not enough to suggest that this was a drug that needed to be licensed. Nonetheless, the safety profile is very clearly demonstrated, and it's certainly something that we do use off license in this population, either with or without cholinesterase inhibitors. Where are we going to get our definitive answer from? 
Well, we hope to get this from the COBOL study, which is currently ongoing, led by John Paul Taylor up in Newcastle, together with an Australian partner. And COBOL is an RCT of using memantine as an adjunct in Lewy body dementia and PDD for people already on cholinesterase inhibitors. So it's really answering that question, is it worthwhile pursuing this course? And unfortunately, because of COVID, this trial has been delayed, but it's about to kick off. So we'll get our answer in a couple of years. Just double check the time here. Okay. Now, so let's leave dementia prone and PDD aside, and let's focus on cognitive impairment in profile one type patients. In other words, people coming in with subtle cognitive changes, mild cognitive impairment in PD, often still working age, but they just find that they can't quite capture the cognitive ability they had before, but they are not at the level of dementia. So difficulty with attention, working memory, executive dysfunction, largely driven by dopaminergic and noradrenergic deficits. So the approach here has to be very different. So here's an example of a trial of atomoxetine, which really targets noradrenaline through the locus cerulis. And there's a number of small studies like this. Again, none of them big enough to give us a definitive answer, but it's suggesting, that's my time, but it's suggesting that we need to be start manipulating this pathway in order to address these subtle cognitive difficulties. And as a field, it's not something we've particularly focused on. And yet the impact on people, particularly of working age, is absolutely huge. And so it's something we need to get a lot more information about. Now, in the interest of time, I'm going to stop, but I'm just going to run briefly through my sides to orient you because I think you will get them. Um, and so just to give you a flavor of the kinds of things that we need to be thinking about in this field of addressing cognition um, and other neuropsychiatric aspects. So I go on to give a few slides about apathy. And again, this is important. Why? Because apathy is an extremely important predictor of cognitive decline. And potentially, if we see that we can address apathy, we might be able to slow progression to dementia, but that study has absolutely not been done, but a very important avenue to explore. And what this slide shows here is that we see here, we see cognition and apathy traveling together, so to speak. So as apathy starts to emerge, cognitive impairment emerges, and they travel together, moving into dementia. So can we address apathy? There are a number of different trials, some small, some big, so not always definitive. And I've got a slide here summarizing these for people who are interested. And also then the next part of my discussion, which I won't be able to address today, is looking at non-pharmacological interventions. And there are a number of these, including cognitive rehabilitation, cognitive stimulation therapy. And at the end, there's a few slides looking at neuromodulation as potential for cognitive impairment treatment, particularly in the early stages in PD. I'm going to leave it there and you can um, take a look at these uh, when you get the slide set. So I'll stop sharing and we can take some questions. Thank you very much, Ira. And um, just for delegates, the slides um, will be available next week together with a recording of this. So um, if they want to dive in deeper to the things that Ira didn't have a chance to um, cover, that will be available. Um, we have no questions at the moment, um, but I have a question. My question is about uh, ICD, and Suzanne, you talked about the difficulty in starting that conversation, and, and what are your hints and tips to get that true picture from the patient in front of you? Yeah, so I find actually both for impulse control disorders and for hallucinations, uh, I think it, it's to normalize it. This is a part of Parkinson's. You ask everyone these questions. You know, certainly when I say hallucinations, I say a third of people with Parkinson's get hallucinations. Do you? And the same for impulse control disorders. It's part of Parkinson's and the medications that they affect the way your brain works. And people might start to do things that are out of character and absolutely normalize it. So this isn't, do you mind me asking? This is a really sensitive thing. I, I just put it out. This is normal. This is a normal part of what we expect. Is it happening you? And, and that takes away this feeling that people are confessing something to you. So, you know, make it normal. This is common. We're expecting this to have happened to you. Has it happened yet? And that way people feel, yeah, this is OK. I can open up. I'm not sure, Ira, do you have a different way of approaching it? But that's mine. Make it normal. Just, you know, de, de, uh, what would I say? Desensitize people. You know, we talk about this all the time. I'm comfortable talking about your sexual habits. It's not going to phase me. Off you go, you know. 
Uh, Susanna would absolutely agree. And again, with, for example, starting the dopamine agonist, the most important thing with ICDs is prevention. So you would have that conversation even before symptoms might arise. In other words, here's this drug and it comes with certain risks and these are the drugs. Let's start that conversation and continue it and I will check with you every time. So I think the absolute key thing in terms of management is prevention, education and awareness and having that conversation. Brilliant. Um, here, I think there's a question for you from Rakesh Pabu. Is there a time limit for the medications for dementias in a deteriorating patient who has been treated for three to five years, i.e. stop meds or no further gain? Oh, that's an interesting question. First of all, we don't have data on that because nobody has been followed in terms of a controlled way for that length of time. Um, I think from the clinical perspective, you continue as long as you think it's helpful. And if you decide for whatever reason you want to withdraw, generally because the person is starting to move in a much more advanced stage and they can't take medications or you're rationalizing the medications anyway, and I'll defer to Suzanne, who, who's a palliative care specialist with this, but then you, I would suggest strongly that you do it extremely carefully and slowly, if, particularly if it's called an esterase inhibitor. In other words, you come down to the next lower dose. So if you start to say it's denepazil, you go from 10 to five and you would hold them there for a couple of months, see how they respond. Because if you suddenly stop, um, if particularly if it's oral medication, quite often you see people absolutely fall off the cliff with that cholinergic withdrawal. So whatever you do, um, you know, have, do it very, very slowly in increments and watch what happens and be ready to reverse your decision should you find that the patient is in fact dependent, if you will, on, on that, uh, those neurotransmitters. Brilliant. Thank you. Rakesh says thank you very much for that. So super duper. Um, a uh, question from Wissam. Please, can you tell us how we differentiate apathy from short memory deficits? Apathy from, from what? From um, short memory deficits. Short memory deficits. Oh, um, well, one is cognitive and the other is <clears throat> not really behavioral because, of course, apathy is a a behavioral cognitive syndrome highly related to much more executive and attention function so there isn't really a memory component so whereas the presentation of apathy as a behavioral syndrome is a harbinger of more severe cognitive symptoms to come like a dementia syndrome it certainly is very different so if you think about the me about your, I wondered, did the person mean, you know, when someone isn't taking part in things anymore they don't seem as interested how do you know that that's apathy as opposed to they cognitively can't take part anymore oh, they've okay pulled, they've pulled out of the conversation because they can't follow it anymore because they can't keep keep it in memory i think that's maybe what they meant because i was hoping you'd answer that question oh, sorry <laughs> clearly i misunderstood the question uh, because the, in that case suzanne the same question we asked about depression you know is somebody not engaging because they're apathetic they're depressed or because they're, they're cognitively ultimately i think it's a combination of those things um but um, if you think about a pure, so to speak, apathy syndrome, it kind of has three components. It's lack of initiation, it's lack of interest, and it's emotional blunting. But generally, if you do stimulate the person, very often they will have a hedonic response to whatever it is. In other words, let's go to a movie, in spite of the fact that you say you're not interested, they will enjoy the movie. And so therefore you can kind of differentiate that from depression. When it comes to cognition, it's slightly harder. I mean, obviously you would do a clinical exam and do cognitive testing and that would be revealing it. Um, and again, these things, behavioral cognitive uh, syndromes are highly tied up. So I think it's sometimes hard to tease apart. Um, mm, it's not a very good answer, is it? No, it's absolutely fine. Um, I'll take one more question before we say a thank you, which is from a Parkinson's nurse, um, Catherine Cole. Thank you, Catherine. I'm a nurse specialist. When I'm in clinic seeing patients, is there a brief screening tool or any key factors that I need to identify so that I could start referring patients for cognitive assessment? I.e., is there a way I can apply the risk factors to identify the right group to refer to memory services? Well, could I say, I mean, one thing I forgot to say, it's not obviously all about cognitive screening. It's also asking the person and their family, do they think they have problems with memory? And that's something that takes no time at all. So I would start by asking the person, how do you find your memory and asking their, if their carer is with them? But, you know, even the MOCA is quite a short cognitive test. It doesn't take that long to do. You know, um, if you had no time at all, the clock drawing test is a really good quick test because it's going to pick up your visual spatial and your attention and things like that if you only had 30 seconds. I don't know what you think, you're if you 30 seconds with the person, what, what one test would you do? Um, I think the 
pill questionnaire is always very attractive. Now, in subsequent years, it's less valid than initially it was thought. In other words, the pill questionnaire is you ask the patient whether they can tell you what their medications are. And if they can't, that's a good indication that they're cognitively impaired because either somebody's having to give their medications or because their regimen is complex. Um, but, you know, it has flaws, but nonetheless, that can be extremely helpful because at the very least, it gives you an indication of the degree to which the care partner has intervened. And one thing I'll just add is when asking um, family members or informants about whether the person needs help with X, Y, Z, be specific. In other words, are you having to help them with their finances because they can no longer sign because of Parkinsonism or is it or micrographia or is it because they actually don't understand, in other words, in terms of their financial judgment and so on. Um, and sometimes people have to think as to why they've taken over certain aspects of care uh, and making that differentiation between is this the motor or is it because of cognition and understanding. Brilliant. Well, here on that, um, I thank both you and Suzanne for a great talk and lots of our delegates are thanking you too. So again, huge thank you, Ira and Suzanne. Take care.